Um, yeah, it's great to be here, um, and uh, it's pretty exciting stuff, I'd have to say. Um, we got involved in this about 18 months ago when, uh, well, no, I'll go back a bit further. We've been uh, looking at this technology since CSRO started developing something in that space about 20 years ago. Um, but about 18 months ago, there's been quite a flurry of activity in terms of bringing some of this stuff to market. Um, so so we're pretty, uh, we were pretty keen to see what it might mean for the New Zealand farmer. So who knows what virtual fencing is? Anybody? A few people? Okay, somebody suggested it was uh, pioneered by a guy called Dean Anderson in the 1970s who had some sort of um, brainwave and he thought that maybe we could have virtual fences to control animal movements around uh, the environment. But again, we want to go back a wee bit further than that. Um, for about the last eight or 10,000 years, we have been controlling animal movements. So in the first instance, we um, would bring them in at night to protect them from predation, right? protect our assets. That was a good idea. Then we moved on to actually housing them indoors to keep them out of the weather during you know, severe northern hemisphere winters. Then we went on to controlling the grazing so that we could use the resources better, especially once we got to the point where we actually um, had some land tenure and actually owned the land. Right? So we've been controlling animals for a very long time. Um, and this is the next step. So we're moving beyond physical barriers and now we're working towards using animal behavioural uh, instincts to control the animal. So I'd just like to acknowledge all the co-authors there. There's a team of us working in agri-research uh, and we're working with PAMU, um, previously known as, uh, or formerly known as Landcorp, and we're also working currently with Adjacents who are providing the technologies. That's an Australian company that's commercialising the CSRO purchases. So I want to start and talk a little bit about learning new skills. Actually, what I want to really do is actually start and say, I want this to be interactive all the way through. So if at any point you have a question, please stop me and ask the question. We'll get the mic to you and we'll get the question and we'll work on um, whether or not we have an answer. Okay. They may not all have answers, these questions. But anyway, if you're learning new skills, and, if, and this actually goes well beyond cattle and um, hens, it goes to any uh, of our sentient beings, including ourselves, the important thing is that it is predictable and controllable if you're going to learn something new. Right, okay? So for cattle, for example, in the, in the virtual herding sense or the virtual fencing sense, it's knowing where the boundary is and being able to predict where that boundary is and then control the outcome, right? And I'll talk to you a little bit about how the technology works in a minute. Another example, which is really interesting, is hens, when you put hens into a new situation, right? Nobody thinks about this from an animal welfare point of view, but when you take hens out of a cage system and put them in a barn system and you scare the crap out of them, Quite literally, because has anybody has anybody ever um, done the recovery hen thing where you get some hens from from a cage system and then you take them home and you and you put them down on the ground and they crouch there for three days thinking, what is this and what am I going to do next? Has anybody done that? It's a fascinating experience. Those those animals have to go through a learning process to figure out what to do next because they're so ingrained in what they've already got. And we do that as humans as well. But in the past, what we've done is the cues that we've given the animals are things like barbed wire and electric fences and posts and rails. So we've given them a visual cue so that they know not to do that. And there are consequences. So if you try to get over a barbed wire fence, how many people have ripped their pants on a barbed wire fence? There are consequences. You try to get over an electric fence while it's on and you miss the, you know, the space between the pulses, there are consequences. And if you run into a post and rail fence, there are consequences. 
Well, the future barriers that we're talking about now are going to be things like sound and vibration and pulses. Okay, so it's just a different set of cues. So it's quite <coughs> important to have that in your mind when you start thinking about this technology. And again, I'll go through the, the system uh, in a minute. So how are we doing so far? Let's uh, kind of set the scene there. It's all good. Okay, okay, so this one here is a general descriptor of um, most of the systems that will potentially be available in the near future. And this just happens to be the eShepard from Agisons. So you have, you start with a, a neckband on the animal, which has GPS enabled capabilities, that has a few other things in the collar, including accelerometers and other bits and pieces. It connects to a base station, which runs on uh, low frequency radio, so it's a LoRa network, it's what's called the LoRa <coughs> network. Um, that can then link to your local computer and go to the cloud, provide you with information on your smartphone and your tablet. Um, and as a sort of a, a, it's not quite a secondary part, but a, a subsidiary part is where it works with the satellites which provide you with your global positioning. Right, so that's how it works. So, you, and then if you do the reverse, you start here, you set up a fence, it goes through the process, sends the, the new fence out to the animal, and then the animal has a new boundary. Right, so it goes the other way as well. That's generically how it works. And the, this is the E Shepherd version. Um, it has a, uh, probably most importantly, has an aerial in the backbone. It has some solar panels to keep it powered, because GPS takes a lot of power, right? And then it has a, a strap that goes around the neck with a counterweight on it to keep it uh, firmly on the back of, back of the neck of the animal. And then you'll note here, it points out there are a couple of little electrodes on there which provide a pulse, which is part of the training package, so that the animal recognises the sound as the fence. Right, so that's, that's how it all works. Hey, Dave. Sure. Do they provide information on where the cattle have been moving? Like, is that something you can, data you can take out of that? Yes. So um, I haven't got a screenshot of the, so you actually get software which you install on your computer, for example, or in the office, and you can actually see animals in near real time. There's usually a slight delay because the base station has to talk to the collar and the collar has to talk back. And then, so it would be, you know, within 15 minutes, you would be able to figure out where that animal was on a, basically on a near real time basis. The grazing behavior. Yep. And I'll, I'll show you a, um, a map of some of the stuff that we've done shortly. All righty. Okie dokie. So, anybody want to know anything about the technology? Any more about the technology? Cost of the collars? Cost of the collars? Uh, the collars has not been set yet. Um, but let me suggest it could be in the range of 250 to $500. And, and there will be different, there are different costing models. So some of the companies are talking about selling the collars and other companies are talking about leasing the collars so that if there's upgrade in technology, you get an automatic upgrade. Okay, so, so there are different models around. So let's just talk about the... Yeah. So there are three barriers, new barriers, sound, vibration, and... A pulse. A pulse. So do you, I can talk about that if you like. Yeah no, um, yeah, no, we'll get to that. We'll get back to that. No worries. <laughs> okay, so just to give you an idea of who's in the space. So, now the Sirius Tag people are providing a, uh, a solar powered air tag that only does about four GPS um, readings a day, and it's mostly around stock security. It does have some accelerometers and such like in the thing. 
and they will probably use a uh, low orbit um, satellite network rather than the LoRa network, so it'll actually have much better um, connectivity and but it hasn't got any virtual fencing power in it at the moment. Um, but potentially very, very good for Nate, I'd have to say, because actually you'd know where all of your cattle were all of the time. Um, the Vents people, is, uh, they're a US come New Zealand um, concern, uh, based in New Zealand connections out of Gisborne, plastic manufacturer in Gisborne, who also farms up there. Um, the no fence people out of Norway are doing it for goats, but I don't think they have any solar options. So the goats have to come in every night and charge coals have to be recharged. Um, stops them from straying onto the highway, I'm sure. Um, that was probably mean of me to say that. Uh, Halter, uh, the New Zealand company, um, mostly. Uh, international investment in that space. They've got about 40 people working in Auckland on this. Um, the collars in this, these positions, they are mostly working in the dairy industry. Those are halter collars. Uh, they're not quite complete. They too have a, a counterweight that sits underneath as, a, um, as part of the strap to hold that in the right place. And those are, there's now a new generation already. They haven't even released them and they have another collar design which is a flexible rubber one, which is really quite cool, actually. <laughs> and they have, they have a huge amount of um, tech going into there. They have uh, a dairy farm which has been running for 12 months with these collars on and have been developing various algorithms and control systems to go with that. So, so that's pretty good. And then the people we've been working with um, have been the Adjacents group and they are in the, in the beef industry, pretty much, um, looking at large-scale beef operations. So, so uh, virtually all of the technologies use the same training protocols, as far as I'm aware. Well, they're very similar training protocols. Um, so, so, do we want to talk about the training protocols now? Because everybody wants to know about this stuff, right? So we say, well, the, the fence is a sound, right? It's a sound, the animal It's a sound in the air, and it's got to stop. Right, now, to get to that point, you actually have to train those animals so that they know that the sound means that they should stop. And so how do you train animals? You provide them with an immersive stimulus, which in this case is a small pulse of electricity. Um, so, now, and so the first thing I'd have to say is I've tried this pulse of electricity <laughs> quite, quite purposefully. <laughs> and uh, let me tell you, an electric fence is so much worse, a lot worse, to be quite honest. So, so the pulse itself is like deep muscle, muscle stim stimulation, if you've ever had anything like that. And it will make your muscle clench. But that's about it. And it surprises you. And by clenching, you know, well, well, we had them on our arms, and so we dropped them on the ground. And, and you make a funny face because you go, wow. But there's no after effect. Right? So there's no, there's no long term effect on the. On. And that's partly because the pulse is relatively low. It's a lot lower than an electric vent shock. Um, and it sits between two points on the skin. It doesn't ground, it doesn't go all the way through the animal. So. So there's a whole heap of things in there. So, so that becomes the training package. You know, they get a two seconds beep, and then if they keep walking in the direction of the fence, they get a pulse. And when we've observed these animals, they pretty much, if they're in a herd situation, turn around and go back to their herd. Right? And so, so um, and it takes them about 48 hours for most of the animals to avoid getting a pulse. They will listen to the beep and they'll turn around and go back to the herd. So, so it works quite quickly. Um, there's a few other things that these guys build into the collars to make sure that they are safe for the animal. So if the animal's running at a fence, if you've ever seen a cattle mesh run at a fence, not even a normal fence will stop them. So what they do is they turn the technology off, pretty much. So they've got an accelerometer in there. They know that the animal's moving quickly. You're not going to stop it, so you let it go. And what you're doing then is making sure that you're not 
punishing the animal in situations of flight when they might walk to that way. Um, but what they do is the, the, the software itself resets the fence once the animal stops moving and then slowly brings it back to the herd. So it's, it's actually pretty cool. And, and the examples where they've seen animals do that are uh, the animals are back with the herd inside of about an hour and a half. So they work their way back. And because they're herding animals, that's what they do anyway. It's not fast enough if there's bloat on, potential for bloat. Sorry? If there's lots of clover. Oh, yeah, if they, be, if they break the out into a dead, really high dead. quality feed or something. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, that's, that's a separate issue. <laughs> Natural colour <calm>, mix. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> that's just all the black ones. <laughs> so, um, so, so they built in a whole heap of that sort of uh, fail safe systems to make sure that the animal is kept safe. All right, so, so, and, and like I say, they seem to work pretty well. Um, yep, okay. So, so why, why are we working in this? So somebody said, oh, I thought you were in nutrition or whatever else. Um, pasture management, this is all about nutrition and pasture management if you actually want to make a dollar out of it. <coughs> Apart from environmental uh, considerations and protecting the biodiversity on your farm from cattle grazing. Um, so we got involved in this. The Ag Research has a program um, about the bioeconomy in the digital age. We have quite a significant amount of funding in there and we're looking at how we harness digital technologies. So we're not about building new sensors or anything, we're about how you apply this at farm systems level to make a difference. And so we've already had, we've already had Max talking about the power of the beef cow and you know how you've got to have those on your hill country. Absolutely ideal hook up with this technology. We had the balance every nutrients people talking about um, protecting your, you know, the spaces that that where where your hot spots, environmental hot spots. This fits that nicely. So what we're doing is we're working through a whole heap of use cases from an ag research point of view, trying to enable outcomes around land use decision, for example. So if you're thinking about virtual fencing, um, what are the opportunities, for example, of actually um, grazing some of the conservation estate. So, so in the Mackenzie Basin, they've retired um, one of the big stations up the Ahuriri River. One of the consequences of that retirement is the grass has got too long for the native wading birds to <coughs> actually nest because it's now a danger to them from a predator point of view. Now, it's unintended consequences. So potentially, maybe you could use virtual herding technologies like this to actually graze that out once or twice a year and then take the cattle out of that environment again. You actually don't need a physical fence anymore to achieve multiple outcomes on different pieces of land. Kind of useful. So what sort of, uh, what sort of technologies are available that might be able to do that? So how do we, how do we pick that up? We're looking a little bit around um, trust and consumer confidence. And, and even a talk like this is about getting an understanding of what these technologies do, how they work, how they might be useful to you which is you know, some of the things that we're, we're trying to do. Um, working through that whole idea of how do we enhance provenance, and again, we've already had talks today about what our provenance means to us and how we need to protect that provenance for our products in the future. I mean, they're the, the keynote speaker today talking about provenance, talking about environment, all those kind of things. Um, and then seeing what other solutions might come out of some of this stuff. All right, so what are we doing in the virtual fencing space? Well, what we have actually done is we've partnered up with Palmu and with Anderson's, and we've had a hundred of these collars on cattle um, just out of Dunedin. So we, we had a, a herd of 
um, one-year-olds, rising two-year-olds. Here's one of them up there with his collar on. This is the farm manager. And what we've done in the very first instance is look at animal safety. Now understanding what the animal's doing. Because if we haven't got the safety of the animal, then we're not going anywhere else. Right? So there's been a lot of work done in the past um, looking at the animal's responses, stress responses, and all those sort of things to this type of technology. And overall, it comes out that uh, this is a mild annoyance to them at most. The actual, the actual pulse that they get is... Um, uh, some of the work showed that it was, it was probably around about the same um, as a yarding event. And that, was, uh, and that was an uncontrolled pulse rather than one that had a, a, a sound before. And what we do find is once they know what the sound is, they tend to avoid it. So it's the same as an electric fence. Have you ever seen a, a trained group of adult animals even get a shock from an electric fence? The observations that have been made says it doesn't happen because they know what the consequences are and they know that they're predictable. <laughs> so, so that's the thing. Um, so what we've been doing is trying to take the data out of the, the, the neck bands to look at the implications for animal behaviour. Right? So in that perspective, what we're doing is Say, so, right, we've got all this GPS data. So we know where this animal is most of the time, within the bounds of GPS variation. And if anybody knows anything about GPS, you'll know it's sort of plus or minus two or three or four meters. However, you can use that to figure out, here's this animal, here's that animal. And you can say, well, these guys are buddies because they're mostly together on the paddock, right? And you, you'll see that in your observations of animals. You know, animals team up and they go around the paddock. So what we were looking for was, if an animal is really, really hates this stuff, then, then he's probably gonna go away and sulk or whatever. So he might end up standing by the water trough forever. And he'll start to break up the associations that he has with his mates, right? And so what we were looking at is using the information in the collars that you get all the time to making sure that the animals uh, maintain their social structures, right? So, so that's one of the things that we've been doing. One of the other things that's come up, which is really quite interesting to us, and we had um, Anna talking about um, social networks and social media and all that sort of stuff, is, um, and it was prompted by the release of this article in the Otago Daily Times, all of a sudden you get people on Facebook and Twitter commenting and it gives you an opportunity to see, mostly see what the extremes of opinion look like when that happens. So what we're doing now is we're looking through all of the, um, all of the Facebook and Twitter stuff that we can find and looking for those comments and we're looking at uh, putting together uh, the changes over time. So when it first comes out, when any, any technology first comes out, you get this, this is the worst thing since the devil you know, was born yeah. on one side, and on the other side you go, this is amazing, right? You always get that, right? And then generically what happens is those opinions kind of come together. And you go, oh, well, it wasn't as bad as I thought it was, and actually it's not doing everything I wanted it to and they sort of come together over time. So we're interested in tracking what happens in that space via social media. Um, and then, then the third thing that we want to do is to characterise what we think are the opportunities in technology like this and look at what that would look like on farm and then look at how it might affect the way we farm in the future. So, so they're, the, they're the spaces that we're working in. Sure. What was the logistics of putting them on and off? What appears to be a two-year-old bull? Were they quite challenging? Yeah. Um, okay, so 
a couple of comments in that space. We actually put them on, it's not a bull, it's a steer. <laughs> they are steer. They were growing very fast. <laughs> um, we actually put them on using just using the race. Uh, and they were a little bit challenged with that because they, you know, they, if they get their heads down, it's a wee bit hard. And the, the, the problem was actually adjusting the tension on the collar to make sure that, that the counterweight, as you can see there, <coughs> sits appropriately. And so it, the consequence of us doing it in the race meant that we got a couple a wee bit loose. Um, when you do them in a head bale, it's very, very easy. Pretty much, you just whack around there. And, Pull them through. So, and interestingly, in those collars there, they have um, a special catch on them, on this, as you can see on the side, which has a, a release strain of 200 kilos. So, if that animal gets it hooked on the fence or on a stick or whatever, he can actually pull it off and the collar will stay behind. The collar will either leave the collar and walk away. So, again, it's another safety feature to make sure that we're not snagging animals up. And then you'll go and have a look at your, um, your dashboard and you'll say, oh, that collar hasn't moved for a day, better go and find it. You know, put it back on an animal somewhere. Yeah. So, so that, yeah, as I say, they've spent a lot of time thinking about making sure that the animal's safe. Um, right. So this was the country that we were working in, the, the animals that we were working with. Um, in this instance, rolling country. Uh, you can't quite tell. Some of, some of this sort of stuff down here, relatively steep sidings, you couldn't see from the base station, so the base station couldn't talk to those collars when they were down in there. So the, then you wouldn't get any data until the animal walked back to the top of the hill, up here somewhere. Um, and the base station saw it. There was even with, we had a slightly modified aerial design um, to boost the signal. So the average range of the base station we were using was 25 kilometres, but there's always black spots in terrain like this. So do you have to have line of sight? Yeah, pretty much for most of it. Yeah. 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 Do you need the always need a base station, or if you have some sort of uh, four or five G coverage, do you sort of this, this technology is working on base stations. Yeah. yeah. As is the halter technology right at the moment. Yeah. 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 So they, they haven't changed to to, um, to mobile phone. More a base station to really well. Yeah. Yeah. The base station that goes with these is like five or six grand. It's very little yeah. compared to the total cost. Alrighty, okie dokie. So just to give you a bit of an idea, this is a whole set of um, data points of animals. Uh, you can see the, um, the, the water source here, down in the bottom of the gully. Um, and what you're looking at, you'll see a slightly darker line here. And then across here, um, that's the virtual fence. And interestingly enough, one of the things that we've, the farmer's been quite keen on is putting the virtual fence just inside the permanent fence to one, avoid damage to the permanent fence, so the permanent fences he thinks are going to last longer, and to stop the collars getting hooked up on the fences. So collar retention is very high once you do that. And so what you can see is, uh, and, and, and interestingly enough, so there's a virtual fence across here. This is actually the top of the paddock, so the highest point on the paddock. And what we saw was um, quite a lot of actually camping activity right up on the edge of the virtual fence. Those so, make the point that it would sort of be a pointless exercise if you had the virtual fence right next to the <laughs> fence in terms of testing the system. Because the fence would stop them going through anyway, wouldn't it? Yeah, yes, it would. Yeah. Yeah. What's happening so, on the top right? Is that the camp, do you think? Up in that top corner? It's actually the bottom corner of the paddock. Um, and I'm not quite sure. There may have been a couple of collars ended up coming off in that corner. And so you get a lot of points in the same place. But um, the, the heartening thing to us, uh, and actually this down this side, 
there's actually an electric fence that ran down to that point there, ran all the way down. Was the heartening thing to us was they all came back to the top of the hill, wherever the top of the hill was. So this was the new top of the hill. And so that's quite a classic um, animal behavior thing. Animals will go and sit on top of the hill and go out and graze and they come back and sit on top of the hill. So they were still exhibiting exactly the same behaviors as we would expect from, from the herd in general. How many animals in that trial? There's 50. So this is a lot more than just one. This is like five days worth of report. So David, how often was the GPS sending a signal? So we were, we were recording every 15 minutes in this instance. How did GPS signals doing under vegetation? If you've got trees. Um, so under vegetation is the question, what, you, what happens then? Um, basically, you get a more, uh, a less accurate position. So in, in, out in the open like this, uh, as long as you had good satellite coverage, you might get plus or minus two metres. Right. But the virtual fence still work, right? It still works, yes, it does. Um, yeah, you, if, if you had them under trees, the question would be why. Um, you, you might get plus or minus 15 metres depending on, on your satellite coverage, right? So, you, so but the point would be that your virtual fence, well, you wouldn't want to draw your virtual fence under a set of trees. You could. Yeah. You could, you could, but I think you'd find a lot more variation would be the trouble. Yeah. David, can I just, yeah. just ask a question about control? I'm not sure gonna, we're going to get to it or not. Have you tried like no, offering, no. offering like lollies to do them under this trial, like a big bale of baleage on the outside and, and if it's a bit short, have you tried um, that? Is that, that's that, that? That has been done. We're not we're not doing it here. Like I say, the first in our very first instance, we're looking at animal safety, um, and then following on from that, uh, what the Palmer guys are keen on is to make sure that the fences continue to charge effectively in the middle of winter. And you've got a whole bunch of grey days, and you've only got eight hours worth of light. Yeah. That's kind of important. Yeah. The guys at Halter tell me that they've done their sums and that they, their collars will work from Invercable to. Qatar, so they reckon they will in, at all, in all seasons. Um, we're, we'll be testing that. Um, there has been some work looking at incentives to say, all right, we've got no grass here, but there's incentives mm. over, the, over the fence. Um, and like any incentive, and any, you know, if you ever break feed crops in the middle of winter, if they get hungry, they break out. Yeah. And that's just going to be standard stuff. You're not going to avoid that. It's, it's no more or less powerful than a standard electric fence. So we just need to figure out where those boundaries are. So how far can you push them before they start breaking out? It'd be interesting out. to find that out. Yeah. And like I say, there are some trials in Australia that are working on that at the moment. Yeah. Is it, is it foreseeable <laughs> yeah. that you could develop a system that doesn't require a power source on the animal? Uh, there have there have been uh, there have been some of that kind of technology um, promoted or potentially promoted. So so you've got an animal that's wandering around and it's got its head up and it's got head down. Why don't we just put a, a kinetic motor in there and, and power them up themselves? Well, I was just wondering if you had an inert chip in them and you could get keep powering from the. Point. No, you, you need too much power to power it up from the far end. The only, they, those inert chips, like your, your microchip from your dog, only work because you're really, really close. Could you power them with methane? <laughs> <laughs> just, just sort of connect it up. Because there's lots of, apparently we have to get rid of all of that so you can power them with that. <laughs> so, so just a thought about um, some of the things that we're thinking about and where we're going next is to the, the virtual fencing is just a tool to be able to harness a whole heap of other things. A tool to be able to do a whole heap of other things. So what if we can um, hook it up with hyperspectral analysis or um, remote pasture reading from space or feed quality readings? Or in, in some of our GIS technologies that we have now. 
you know. And then some of the things that the balance farm environment or the balance people were talking about before around mitigator and putting your farm plan together, you can actually start bundling some of those things up. And all of a sudden you've got a huge amount of power in completely rethinking the way that you do your farming. And actually what you do in your farming. You know. Um, so so this is the kind of things that we're um, thinking about. And I mean, for example, this is one of the projects that we've been looking at. Um, just looking at the mosaic of different aspects and soil types and uh, slopes in our hill country. It's, it's enormous. And now if we have a technology where we didn't have to invest in a fixed fence, so it's a completely different capital investment program. Okay? And it is a capital investment program. Don't get me wrong about that. But it's probably, if you said your, how many, how much time? Um, unless you've been asking questions on the way, so, oh, so you can probably Good job. carry on. But on. All righty. Um, Okie dokie. Right now, it's not um, Unless there's any questions at the moment, we've been asking them pretty well all the way anyway, so um, um, through, um, if there's, yeah, you've got something else to finish on? I was going to finish on, on that one. Yeah, I'll finish on that one. So if you go into completely different environments, so so this is this is uh, station in mid-Canterbury. Um, he has some significant waterways running through his property. But he wants to get into some alternative legumes up on his up on his higher country there. Uh, the potential um, return on that could be really really high if he got it to look like this, full of Caucasian clover and white clover. Right. Um, but it might only be a tiny part of his landscape, and all the rest of brown top. Right. Now, can you imagine, for example, in uh, in spring, he puts cows out on the hill, right? Um, they might have calved down low. They've they've the bull's gone out. Now they're going out into summer. There's all this feed being you know, accumulated on his hill face there, but he only wants the calves to eat it. Right, so he's got collars on the cows. You can keep the cows out of that, keep them on the brown top. They can clean up the brown top. The calves can come down onto the onto the yeah, onto the high quality feed here and then all of a sudden um, you know the beef breeding values don't matter because the calf wing likes is so high. <laughs> yeah. Ideal. So so just the power in that sort of thing. If you take your average 550 um, hectare uh, sheep and beef farm, which probably has maybe four waterways through it, maybe 10 kilometers of waterway, uh, at 10 bucks a meter, it's a fence. Um, somebody will do the maths, a couple of hundred thousand dollars worth of fencing, and you said, I've got, I've got uh, you know, um, 400 cows at $2, 250 bucks a, a, a collar. Uh, you'll actually find the capital investment in the collars is lower than capital investment in the fences. And then you add on the power of, for example, changing feed quality on your farm because you can control the cows better in the right place. So you don't just put them into a paddock, you put them into a corner of the paddock that you can put. You know how it is? We've all seen that. Now you put them in a corner of a hill paddock. But you've got your station. This Sorry? But you've got your station which has to be on its side. Yeah, yes. And uh, you're. Uh, you, you actually, generally you can, um, what you would, the line of sight, the line of sight to the station, this is a good point, line of sight to the station is for when the collar has to talk to the station, right? So it only has to talk to the station when you set the fence. So it gets the coordinates from the station. Once it's on the paddock, it uses the GPS in the satellites to figure oh, out where the fence is. Oh. Yeah. Okay? So it only needs to see the station when you either when either you want the data from the collar or you want to put new data into the collar. Okay? So you can you can still use it <coughs> even though your hill country is quite rough. Isn't the station mobile? Uh, the ones they've set up aren't. 
because usually they want to make sure they connect effectively to the, the, the programming source which tells the whole they're system. They have electric power, so they need better. So they do need a power supply. Yeah. Is there any multiple on the satellite on top that you provide weather, cloud, rain, fire station? Can you so just just, so the, quest, the question was: Does the signal from the does the signal from the satellite is it influenced by the environmental conditions at the time? Seeing things like cloud cover and things like that, there is a small amount of influence, and it's usually atmospheric conditions specifically. And what it will do is it bends the signal a wee bit, so it might move the feet. Right, but generically, uh, most of the time we can see enough satellites that it works. We haven't, we haven't seen a failure in that space yet. Have these, have these collars got similar technology for, with pedometers and heart rate monitors, those sort of things, things like the Lely and the Orflex collars have got? Yes. Pretty much most of these guys are bundling all these technologies together so that they can do exactly that. So the Halter guys, for example, can give you um, estrus, they can give you time of calving, you know, they can do, give you a whole heap of other things that they're building in right at the moment. Yeah, so plus, a, plus the opportunity for things. Okay, I'm just going to um, stop there, I think. Um, thanks very much, Dave. Um, yeah, I suppose the, the limit to it is our imagination, where you can actually use it. Um, you know, um, checking out waterways, uh, and that sort of thing. Um, and especially if you've got a hill country that slips or erodes, or you've got a fence to maintain, or flooding on a depression. Uh, um, you know, uh, that take evidences out, where if you've got virtual fence, um, you, know, you don't have to maintain it. Mm -hmm. um, so just, yeah, just like to give you a gift for uh, a presentation.